Thanks, Thomas. Um, as I said, I'm Bradley Priest. I'm co-founder and CTO of a tech startup based in Singapore. Um, we've been spent the last seven months building a business application in CoffeeScript and Ember.js, and I'm here today to talk about the benefits of client-side frame frameworks. Is this working? Yep, sorry. Um, uh, when you should use them, because you shouldn't always, but also why. Um, I'll also explain why we chose Ember um, and hopefully convince some of you to ha at least have a look. Um, sweet. Uh, and despite what everyone says and all the schedules and stuff, this isn't just an Ember talk. <laughs> I kind of changed it at the last minute. Cool. So uh, building modern web apps, framework is not a four-letter word. Uh, uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, as I said, working with Trey Gecko, we've got a pretty substantial little thing put together at the moment. Um, so, quickly go through it. We've got um, just existing, ah, sorry, existing options when building for the web, um, when you should use a framework, and my recommendation. Um, uh, sorry for that. Got a room full of JavaScript developers. How many of you have used any of the any of the JavaScript MVC frameworks? Can I hear a show of hands? Uh, maybe half. Okay, cool. Um, Backbone, uh, Spine. Angular, <laughs> uh, Batman, Meteor, Ember. <laughs> I've got one hand out the back, that's good to see. Um, so this is a little quote that I said, don't actually even bother ruining it, but um, JavaScript is the way forward. Don't just sit around, wait for things to shake out. There are a lot of frameworks to choose from. Look into it, it's worth it. Okay. So option one, building, your, building yourself a brand new website. First option is just a little sprinkle of J JavaScript. So let's say it's just a normal app, you've got a blog, all you really want is some Ajaxy comments. Cool, stick with jQuery, you don't need a framework for that. Uh, here's an example, this is the first full page app I built. It is simply a piece of code that talked to an API that fired one of these little rockets. Um, annoyed a few of my workmates that way, but cool times. <laughs> See the I'm not sure if you can read the JavaScript, but it just hijacks all the links and then provides some key bindings. But Option two, uh, server-side rendering. So there's been a bit of a uh, controversy about this recently. Twitter came out, they moved all of their client-side stuff back to the server. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you heard about it. Gonna be honest, Twitter isn't probably the best example of a modern client web, web app. It's 140 characters. Um, they were loading a megabyte of JavaScript or something into it, so not sure if I, yeah, not sure if it's a standard pr pr um, practice. And Basecamp, I'm not sure if who here has anyone who's got much experience with Rails. It's a pretty common framework these days. So DHH, those guys, pretty big um, proponents of just using JavaScript for um, presentation. They have some incredible caching and stuff on the back end, so they do all the server side rendering. Um, there we go, so um, simplified, pull the HTML, insert the HTML. Um, so if you want to do this yourself, there's things like PJAX, um, and coming in Rails 4.0 is a piece, a JavaScript framework, JavaScript library called Turbolinks, and what it does is it hijacks every link on your page, um, and instead of changing the page, it fetches the, um, fetches the next page from the server, strips out the body, and replaces it in the page. So because of this, um, doesn't have to recompile CSS or the JavaScript for each page. Um, cool sounding, but there are so many caveats, it's ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't handle 302s. Um, we'll treat any link tag as um, a link. So again, not so sure. And option three, client side. Um, this is where we're talking about when we're talking about MVC frameworks. Uh, if you're building a modern web app, this is if you want a sorry, native sort of feeling modern web app, this is where things are going in my head. Um, you send, instead of sending HTML, you send JSON or BSON or whatever, whatever the hell you want to send. <laughs> um, pros, let's start a reusable API for your mobile apps, more flexible. Uh, but there is the duplicate logic problem. Um, not if you use Node. <laughs> so, just a couple. Get the JSON, load it in. So I'm sure some of us probably done this before. This is how it used to work a couple of years ago. Um, build your templates, insert the HTML, which is cool. Um, but after a little while, you're not just replacing the HTML. You've got to change a 
comment count or the, um, some links next post, the document title. So this will only get you so far hand coding your app. Spaghetti. You'll know who this is. Okay. <laughs> if you're building something substantial, please use a framework. Um, or write your own. Uh, I'm kidding. Please don't write a new framework. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of them out there. If you don't see what you like, have a look around a bit further. There's bound to be something similar. And there are so many frameworks out there. It's Everyone's looking for more help, too. Um, join an OSS project. Okay, which one? Who can name all of these? Anyone? <laughs> um, I think worst logo goes to Backbone. Uh, agree with me here? Yeah. Um, Angular, Backbone, Can, Batman, Ember, Knockout, Spine, Meteor. Um, the latest baby. So how do you decide uh, which one to have a look at? Uh, personally, I'm not sure if I have enough time to look through 9, 10. It, it grows by the day of the JavaScript frameworks out there. So, and to be fair, it de really depends <laughs> on the situation. Uh, lame answer, right? But not all frameworks are equal. So it's not a bad thing. We've got, uh, so who we said we've got a few backbone builders here, right? Okay. What are you building? If you're building yourself a traditional style website, um, basic user interaction, it's more of a consuming than dealing with the website. If your JavaScript is mostly dealing with presentation, and there's little or no Ajax talking to the to the server, then honestly, you're probably not going to need any sort of framework or anything at all. Again, back with my comment. Uh, next step, I, I interactive website. So you've got some user interaction. Um, the page reflects data that which can change, um, and if multiple areas of your of your page are changing by this data, then that's when you start thinking about this. And so this one's taken straight off backbone. So this is the example of a to-do list. So you've got, I don't have a pointer, you've got your checkboxes for your to-dos, you've got the what needs to be done, you've got an um, item count, oh, cool, um, item count, and if, you, oh, that's not live, and it also does um, the clearing and everything. So if you're going to, if it's got a little bit of user interaction, seriously consider a framework. Or building your own by shoving components together, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm focused on, and on what I think is the way forward, is more complex web applications. So we've got lots of user interaction, frequently talking to the uh, database, or data store, I mean local storage, I'm not going to judge. judge. Um, and if it could possibly be a desktop mobile app instead, look at a serious um, framework. So I think this is this is Travis CI. Um, so everything's completely live updated. Um, yeah. Uh, Zendesk. Can you even see this? It's completely blurred out for me. No. Okay, that's a useless useless photo. Anyway, <laughs> who has used Zendesk? No. Oh. Next. Gmail. This is a web application everyone uses every day. Um, Flow. He's really washed out. Okay. So these are complex web apps, lots of user interaction, um, constantly talking to the database, and um, multiple parts of the app. The entire app changes depending on where you are. Okay. Um, now is when I kind of get into my little evangelical stuff. So who here has developed for mobile, desktop, software as well? We've got a few of us. So if you're building for iPhone, um, majority of the time you're going to build using Cocoa Touch. You, you get deep in there, you use some of the core libraries or Reductive-C. But Cocoa Touch is a nice, gives you a good layer, handles most of the interactions for you. Same for Android on Android, um, Cocoa and .NET on your OSX and Windows platforms. S but there's nothing that really handles everything for the web, um, in my opinion. Um, and this is where Ember is trying to come in. So we've already had two digs at Ember in the two talks I've seen today. So um, <laughs> there's obviously a lot of controversy around it. Uh, it, it's, it does a lot. And I'm kind of here to explain that maybe doing a lot is a good thing. So convention over configuration. I don't think anyone here would really argue that Ruby on Rails is the biggest thing to happen to web the web in the last 
six, seven years. Um, this that was convention of the figure configuration is the reason they got so popular. They made a lot of choices for you, a lot of smart choices. Um, you can change them if you wanted, but it was always easiest to go the default way. Um, and this one's kind of laziness is a virtue. Um, I'll explain that a little bit as we go forward. But it's you want these frameworks here to manage the complex, boring stuff, leave you free to work on the exciting problems. Um, and I'll just put a caveat in now. When I'm talking about these Ember, that could easily be swapped out for Angular JS, or you can build your own sort of um, around Backbone. There's a lot of um, functionality you can plug things together. So yeah, sorry. If Ember's not your cake, um, cup of tea, feel free to have a look around. But please look at some some sort of framework. Laziness is a virtue. So I think everyone here should know that. So DOM manipulation is a lot more expensive than JavaScript changing, changing JavaScript. So one of the things that Ember's all about is not updating the DOM unnecessarily. To do that, we try and keep all of the the truth, the logic, not the, not the logic, the truth, what's happening in the JavaScript and just reflect that in the DOM rather than changing multiple parts of changing DOM itself. So I'll give a bit of an example. So this is a to-do app. Um, this is the backbone one, but this is how most people build a to-do app these days. So we've got three things here. Now let's, let's say I go ahead um, and I hit mark is complete. I'm sorry, mark all is complete. Can you read that on the right? So we've got um, three to-dos on, on the right here. We've got a little app on the left. So let's say I click mark all is complete. Um, what it's going to do, it's going to go through and get the first to-do. Check it. Is done. True. It's going to change. Check your box. And it change two items left. Three items to two items. And it's going to put this clear one completed item in there. Okay, that's there's three changes of the DOM so far. It's up in, just here. Um, and while it's still going, it's going to change the second one to true, which is another checkbox. Um, one item left and clear two completed tasks. And then it finally finishes. It's got all three of them now. Zero items left. Clear three completed items. That's nine changes to the DOM for one mark all is completed. So this is where Ember has taken a little bit of an, uh, has tried to get around this a little bit, um, make this things easier. So when you check mark all is complete in Ember, it's going to register the click and it's going to set to do number one to true, to do number two to true, to do number three to true, and after that's Check them all, it'll set items left to zero, completed items to three, and then change the DOM one, two, three, four, five. So five changes instead of nine. Which doesn't sound like much, but when you've got five hundred, a thousand um to do's, so let's we'll say there's a thousand, in traditional one that's two thousand changes for um sorry, yeah, three thousand changes with these ones. For Ember you're looking at a thousand and two, which starts to make a bit of a difference. How do we do this? Um so Ember uses something called the run loop. Um, so whenever there's some sort of interaction with the app, it starts a loop, runs the app code, and not until it's finished running through um, running through the loop, running through the code that it's been given, will it actually update the DOM. So in this case here, it's run through all the JavaScript because it knows that it needs to update all the to-dos before it then goes and updates the DOM. So yeah. Um, these are the browser events. It's defaults too. There's a lot of them there. You've got to bind to them yourself um, if you want them, and you can also supply custom ones. If what's actually missing there? There's some touch stuff missing anyway. Um, okay, convention over configuration. So you may hear who here has actually heard about Ember before today? Good or bad? Okay. <laughs> So it supplies a lot of things for you. It, it gives you your basic app structure, its um, views, models, controllers, a router, um, outlets. Um, who's has anyone had much had much experience with Objective C? It's stealing some, yeah, not stealing. Oh, borrowing techniques from people who've been doing client um, native apps for a long time. So stuff worth stealing. Sorry. So when it comes to managing one of the, an MVC app, um, one of the things that becomes quite a problem pretty quickly is setting up and tearing down bindings observers. So let's say, do I have a picture? Nope. Um, 
so you yeah when you changing between views you make make sure you remove all your bindings all your event bindings all your observers otherwise you end up with zombies um, zombie bindings zombie views um, which can just obviously eat up more and more memory um, this is how it does a view setup so you define sorry this is a router so I'm not sure if you can read this so let's say we go to root post slash two and then it's going to get your view which is just a JavaScript file which pulls in a handles files file a controller and then finds your post and then inserts that into an outlet in your page so you say this is where I want my data to be for this particular part we'll build it for you no worrying about um, transforming the, H the JavaScript JSON into HTML no we're not worrying about rendering it specifically uh, you enter the the route it'll render the view and again tear down so parent views are aware of the child views so if you remove a view all the child views get removed automatically keeping away from the zombies uh, another bonus of this is with the um, in the lifecycle events of inserting and removing events, um, re removing views, we've got a couple of things for dealing with third parties. So, who's here ever tried to mash five or six different JavaScript plugins together to get something working in the in the front end? You run with this. So, I've just defined. <laughs> can we read that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a custom text field here. So, it's a standard text field, but when this element is inserted to the DOM, we're going to run this um, JavaScript which just sets up the date picker. Um, you can do the same thing, destroy it on the way out, but usually that will go with you. Yeah. So, handling events. We've got a thing called an event dispatcher, which is probably a little bit above what we need to be talking about right here. But again, remember, laziness is a virtue. So, Ember's not rewriting things it doesn't have to. So, everything is just delegated straight to jQuery.on. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows what that is, at least. <laughs> Why, no, don't need to deal with click. Uh, don't have, don't need to deal with events when jQuery can do it for you. So we, st you just sorry, the event dispatcher stores events to be ex uh, expected on each of the views that have been inserted. Once some uh, uh, an event is fired, it bubbles up until it finds uh, something to that's been attached to. Good old jQuery. So yeah, so we've got uh, just a bit of handlebars here, but this is one of the views. So we're in a post, we've got the body text, action, go to edit, this. So that, it fires, it bubbles up, it goes to the router, it says, look, I need to find this, go to edit, transitions to the edit page. Okay. Back to convention over configuration. So they handle views for you, um, tear, set up, tear down, um, basic structure. Another important thing to get nice, clean, async, native feeling apps um, is, sorry, I forgot where I was going with this. But anyway, so Ember has a data library built into it. Uh, it's getting more and more flexible. <laughs> sorry. So a point of things when talking about a data library, so identity maps. You call for an object, you go back, you leave the page and come back and you want to call for the same object again. We've got that stored in JavaScript. Uh, if you're building a client side web app, I hope you, you need to have this sort of functional, fun functionality built in. It's noticeable to users. And also um, object lifecycle man management. So if you are editing an object, we save the changes, sorry, we save that an object is dirty, and not until you commit um, call commit on it will it actually be pushed to the data to the server. Other goodies, um, so as I said, it's one well of the main retort to Ember that I hear so far is that it is pretty big. Um, it's because it includes a lot of stuff. So Ember polyfills all of the array um, into ES5. Um, it um, cool things like object .keys. Um, I don't think observes gone quite well. Um, and it provides a full object model with mixins and super. So if you come from maybe a Ruby or a Python sort of background, you're used to the class objects, 
it's nice and familiar to you. Um, everything just works. No need to write object doc, sorry, post dot prototype dot extend dot equals. Just use dot create dot extend. Build yourself your mod um, objects. Um, and one of the main things, I'm going to just pretty much target Tim here, at the back. <laughs> it's here to stay. Um, there's complaints that these things are disappearing. Um, if they agree with Irene that jQuery is not going anywhere. Um, I feel the same way about Ember. It's there's an uh, entire consultancy built around it. Got 169 different committers, 2,000 commits in I think it's a year now. So last commit was a day ago. Go open source. And it's being used by some pretty big names: uh, Square, Travis, Sendesk, Living Social, Groupon. Throw us in the corner there. We don't really belong. Um, it's got a lot of support in the background. Oh, well that was it. Thanks, everyone. What about like things that don't want to run Ember very well? What are you going to do about them? Things like, that don't. Like, they don't want to run Ember, like you know. IE seven. Like, yeah, IE seven, <laughs> IE eight, like mobile browsers, things like so that. So IE eight runs pretty well. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. IE eight uh, runs pretty well on Ember. Our particular code is definitely the bottleneck in that. So it, there's a lot more to worry about before that. Um, older mobile devices is going to be a problem, but it's pretty fast, and it's only because of how it's um, it's very declarative. Um, they do a lot of stuff behind the scenes, which is a downside, but it also means that you automatically get improvements without having to really think about it. Like when object.observe comes in to popular major browsers, that's going to speed the the whole thing. Everyone's frameworks up without having to actually do anything. All right. Th didn't answer right. the question. Uh, no, that's cool. Try again. You know, like I mean, it would be nice if like. You know, you had the ability to just like get that stuff in. You didn't have to rely on Ember to, you know, so to there is do that th stuff. that's one thing that they really fix it yourself. <laughs> maybe maybe you could have your own component. Uh, hi, um, can you explain a little bit about how Ember.js handles uh, zombie views and how it also handles those permanent links when they tr when you go to a link in Ember.js and it tries to load a resource. Sometimes in Backbone.js when you try to go to a link and then resource is not available because it needs to load the model first. So I'm just curious on how Ember.js handles the lifecycle events. OK, uh, so two points. First one, um, unless you're manually creating views, uh, zombie views aren't actually an issue uh, because Ember handles the whole lifecycle. It makes sure if you're leaving a page or leaving a certain area, it will tear down any related views that need to be removed um, whilst removing all, all that stuff. And the second part was, sorry. Um, Oh, uh, permalinks. Okay, so permalinks where the um, where the content is gone. Uh, it does in the moment, but I feel like that would be pretty easy for yourself to put together some sort of 404 page internally if you needed to. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a framework level abstraction. Um, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, it's not something I've had to deal with. I'm not sure if that answers. No.